Hello everyone, today we talk about the Byzantine Emperor Constant II ruling the Roman Empire between 641 to 668. Uh, um, a very dramatic figure, in many ways if anything for what was going on in the Empire as a whole, the early Islamic invasions, the fracture essentially of the um, Roman Lake of, of the Mediterranean, the um, scramble, really, of this, the, in front of the entire destabilization of the system on other fronts, in the Balkans, in Italy, in Africa, and uh, many other implications revolving around the, essentially, the, the mindset, the, the values, the, the moral system, right, that was, uh, of course, sh uh, shaken by the events, and the provincial attempts of autonomization, based on say, a, a picture, of course, that was favoring that sense of especially uh, seizing control from, from the local bases, but also of, say, definition of certain posture towards the central authority of Constantinople that, in a sense, was ever more distant, right, morally, culturally, uh, and at some point, um, politically, uh, given that, in fact, many lands would abandon the empire by ending under somebody else's rule, right? And importantly enough, this was major watershed regions like Egypt that had been part of the Roman Empire for over half of a millennium, really parting ways from this moment onwards, in spite of the fact that they would remain largely Christian still for, for a consistent amount of time, but preferring even, right, or not really doing much to oppose the Islamic rule on this land and all the issues that had going on with Constantinople and especially these eastern provinces not really facilitating uh, the task. Uh, but there is more than that, right? We will see it uh, then. We will make other videos hopefully about the Islamic invasions because um, everything is less intuitive than it seems. It's not even the fact that they opened the gates to uh, the invaders uh, in retaliation to central authority, but it was really uh, a matter of exhaustion of the entire system, not much from a material point of view, that was also, of course, uh, evident to some degree, but partly from a moral one, right? At some point, this new political situation was decided actively, right? And there wasn't much that could be done to uh, to recompose the picture as the fact that these lands would never be reconquered, in spite of the attempts, by the way, by by the empire. So really, a cataclysmic situation. We still have to talk about Heraclius, and you know here there is a family connection with the emperor that had managed to crush the Sasanian Empire, right? That also was uh, a big factor in the further expansion of Islam. When you actually look at the fact that just a few just 15 years before the rise of Constant II, the Persians had besieged Constantinople, by the way, and you look at what happened later with essentially the same Near and Middle Eastern um, populations, who was pushing from where, you realize there was a massive continuity, like a sort of, you know, push at waves to uh, essentially make this system crumble, right? Uh, with the consequences that arguably you can see to this very moment, given that this land, except for uh, some, you know, centuries under bigger powers, would never quite um, maintain a particular political cohesion and or stability, right? And that, at least, uh, the uh, the true recompaction that had been proper of the uh, unique empire uh, in antiquity would never be uh, re-achieved. Uh, uh, another story is what was happening in the western provinces, especially the European ones, um, that were struggling instead uh, with the increasingly authoritarian uh, character of uh, the empire, right, and the fact that there were, say, in the west some experiments, right, that were very gradually bringing a Latin Germanic awareness of the same imperial potential of the same West, but that are um, at this point manifest, at least in the 
in the level perplexity, for example, towards the imperial policy towards particular heresies that, as you know, had been in part accepted, right, and um, say not persecuted openly by uh, by the center, right, in order to hopefully avoid this uh, provincial collapse, especially in Syria, Palestine, Egypt, that were a big deal for Constantinople more than, um, I don't know, Italy and other Western possessions. In any case, Heraclius left the throne to the firstborn son, Constantine III. Together with Heraclonus, that was the uh, half-brother of Constantine, right son of the second wife of Heraclius, Martina. Constantine III was the father of Constance II, um, and he died only after three months of reign. Right? Uh, in some Byzantine chronologies, the, he is not even counted. Right? In any case, this would leave the young Heraclonus uh, in in charge, right, under the regency of the mother. And this situation, as you know, was quite complicated because a minor ruler and a female regency were, uh, say, very outside the belief of what, in fact, a virile empire was universally conceived like. And, of course, there were other political issues for which, in September, the same 641, mother and son were deposed and mutilated by the order of the Senate of Constantinople. Essentially, there was a general who um, catalyzed this, right, conferring, uh, through fact, the, the legitimate institutions, the power to the son of Constantine III that was actually named Constantine himself, but would come to be known, in fact, as Constance, right, with this name. Um, we, I made a video about the... Constantinian Senate, stressing the, the peculiar characteristics that the Senate of Constantinople founded by Constantine the First uh, had compared to the Roman one, and how important this sense, this mechanism was internally uh, to ensure a that sort of more monarchically autocratic uh, profile that the Byzantine state was uh, coming to acquire. Right, because especially in times of crisis, that was the direction. Right, uh, emergential governments are always more um, martially impositive than than other ones in times in more relaxed times. And in part, you can argue that Constance's accession to power was uh, institutionalizing this uh, violent practice, in fact, of mutilating the. Uh, the the pre the, say the, the previous uh, rulers right that as uh, they were judged unfit for their role uh, were essentially prevented in this way giving physical menomation was not accepted even in fact in the full unity of the of the of the sacred ruler that um, Constantinople tried to maintain even after the the separation of church and state de facto with Christianity and that leaves on in fact in the Byzantine tradition um, with some problems but this is not the video to, to discuss uh, the, the matter I promise I will come back brief, uh, shortly um, to to some consideration about sacral um, royalty right um, but that was nevertheless a quite effective policy Heraclonus had his nose cut while Martina had her tongue severed. And uh, these were the new conceptions, the application of which during these showdowns at the vertex of power offered at the same time a solution that avoided uh, the, the, the killing proper of a sovereign, albeit rendering him inoffensive. By the way, they were imprisoned, as you know, in monasteries usually. Um, in force of the uh, principle, also, for which a mutilated person, in fact, was not that capable of exer exercising the supreme authority, thus ipso facto rendering them unfit for rule, 
from a legal standpoint. Right? Again, the idea is that uh, the ruler had to be a great commander. Right? And if you were uh, morally and physically uh, undermined, right? even just here, having a nose cut right, doesn't uh, dramatically alter your, your vital functions, but the entire impact that this has on you, the fact that somebody could essentially um, carry that out, and you, even if you have um, if you had rebelled, right, and come back to power, which w would actually happen in one instance, um, famously enough, later on in, in, in Byzantine history, um, was showing that you had not been that perfect, absolute ruler that the world deserved, right, especially to be waging war against such dramatic threats, right, your charisma, your aesthetical side of the story was very important, because they believed, really, that um, that degree of menomation was really equating to a further degree of fall that had happened to you anyway. And remember, there was no distinction between what between what happened um, to you in general, like depending on whether it was somebody else or something happening more or less uh, randomly. Uh, it was your fault, like for everything that could have helped to, to prevent that and uh, giving further power to to the same policy that you were called to command, right? So, of course, these um, this, uh, these changes at the top were not even particularly useful in terms of political stability. In any case, Constance, again, would rule, Constance II would rule uh, for 27 years, right? Uh, he was a minor, actually, too, at the time. Um, he was 11, and his minority was essentially protected um, through, uh, of course, a government on his behalf for some years by the Senate of Constantinople that naturally had, as we've seen, um, plotted for the coup and was seizing the opportunity to, to reform um, its political role, right, given that this organism had remained for a long time at the margin of royal power that had been quite volatile and um, and impositive. Just think about various usurpers, the same Heraclius had, as you know, marched in Constantinople, rebelling from, from the West. So um, the, uh, there had been big things going on, including the same siege of Constantinople, etc. So all uh, periods of relative instability that had... Um, made the internal mechanisms of power pass a second um, on the background, let's say, due to the risks of annihilation. This phenomenon, by the way, is typical of the 7th century. It marks uh, a period, the, the period of greatest flourishing of the Senate, per se. Right? Uh, it, it's really about how power was, um, say, shared internally uh, who were the senators and what was their control their connection with, with the rest of the empire so in that regard again today we can't quite digress on it but I made some videos and we will keep discussing uh, at some other point um, f following this time essentially the senate would come back again to purely consultative functions right and as you know, in Constantinople, there was never much of a ruin. The, the Senate had been created exactly right back in the day, uh, in a, with a much lesser oligarchic profile than the one it, it had in the in the West. Right? These were sort of powerful people. Uh, there were aristocrats and so on, but there were also lots of essentially statal functionaries that had been selected in very different way from the the Western nobility that essentially always remained in charge of the uh, of the Senate. Um, in any case, uh, this was done, as you understand, to smoothen the, the monarchic uh, rule, right, by creating even actually a, a large amount of senators, but diluting their power relatively to the resources that they detained uh, around the empire. So the new sovereign found himself in front of this massive issue of what seemed uh, legitimately the unstoppable expansion of the Arabs, right? Galvanized by their new faith, 
right? Uh, again, I, I made lots of videos about Islamic history back in the day. Uh, and for reasons that pertain to the way structured the cycle now, they appear ever less frequently. But it's really important to, to look at that because there are lots of um, interesting insights that you can derive from even just why the Arabs started doing in part what they did, but also how much continuity existed in some views that we think up oh, again, you know, Islam began, right? As if that was coming from nothing. This, this is not exactly it. Right, and we will see it better. But as you know, this fanatism in this incredible load from essentially uh, Bedouins that for the first time said now pillaging caravans were to see actual so the, the most advanced, some of the most advanced uh, uh, centers in the world, right? Uh, opening their gates literally to them would push them further in a, um, in a dynamic that is not to be found. Uh, similarly in, in other parts uh, of the world. At least they were uh, in this era somehow uh, unique in this dynamic. Uh, and uh, if you look at all the various lands that they took over that were inhabited by other, say, by great civilizations as opposed to the semi-nomads, again, you, you must always think, why did this happen, right? What were, that's the key, what were the, those sanitary populations accepting this rule for, right? Were they merely exhausted or were they merely, uh, let's say, um, trying to, to autonomize what, what did happen, right? It's not entirely true that, for example, the Arabs were so much more um, tolerant or, for example, that their taxes were, were actually lighter, especially in this early time of emergency. Actually, we'll see now it was not really the case, um, and uh, etc. But it's also a very complex phenomenon, so you can't quite see that, if not from place to place. In any case, there is a medieval Islam playlist that, in part, uh, explains how the thing happened. Um, the, um, the empire had been brutally shattered. Um, think about the Battle of the Armuk that had basically had, finally, after a couple of other defeats, um, uh, lost Syria to the Muslims, that was not a determined fact, right? You know, if the Arabs had been crushed uh, there, or one of even just of the engagements before, very different political, moral, and religious dynamics would have gone on among them. And remember that many of them were still, like, you know, in between um, the new fate and the um, their own uh, historical deities, uh, and uh, th it could really fail as a whole enterprise. And yes, it, while it is true that there is an exhaustion from the other side, never underest, never overestimate in this sense the uh, the actual potential um, of of the Arabs at that point. Um, in any case, the, the Byzantine Empire had kept fighting even after that, as you know against the Muslims, all right? And these resources prove that still, you know, of course, there was a, a substantial capacity to to oppose them, right? Even though this equated to continuous fighting and uh, huge expenses that were really um, not coming back economically, right? But even at least, right, for the control of those lands were, were worth it. Now, Cyrus, Patriarch of Alexander and civil governor of Egypt, right, opened, on behalf of Constantinople, negotiations when things were really going for the worse, essentially concluding with the Muslims a peace treaty that de facto attributed to the Arabs the entire province of Egypt. So this was a massive big deal, right? Uh, they essentially obtained uh, the uh, the safety of the imperial garrison a retreat from the city before September, the city of Alexander from September 642, right, which happened on September the 12th specifically, reaching Rhodes uh, by sea and um, shortly afterwards the Islamic general Amr took control of the city. 
Now, th this is a huge deal for, for many reasons, not just for the fact that, uh, as we know, Egypt had been a, an imperial province for, for several hundreds of years, but of course the fact that um, not just Egypt per se, but mostly, together with Syria and Palestine, were a bit like um, massive granaries and or um, major, to say the least, hubs of international trade. It is true that we are in the 7th century, the system was contracting dramatically. And part of the reason why you see this uh, the system exhausting itself is, is exactly this. Like the, even the Arab advance was an, a natural consequence of the fact that if you manage to have an empire like the Byzantine one in extension, say in the times of Justinian, it, uh, resources contract dramatically, um, the, the surplus that you have is going to be ever less sufficient to extend your control uh, over a certain amount uh, of territory and this this is going to withdraw in a way or another and others are going to seize control and when you look at uh, these areas you don't see just things like the the Arabs really controlling places that had been for example in the hands of the Persians and that were continuing this sense to fund the struggle against the Roman Empire but you see the same Byzantine subjects of places, in fact, like the Levant, uh, broadly meant, mostly, at least um, accepting uh, with favor the arrival of the Islamic uh, conquerors because of the this deep hatred that had established itself at that point due to the religious differences that separated them from Constantinople and more concretely what the imperial control of these provinces really meant. Right Here I should make a massive digression regarding the, the very nature of the empire that we explained in, in many ways when you look at the Byzantines and formerly the Eastern, Eastern Roman Empire you realize that this division also with the West followed the pattern of essentially the Latin and the Hellenic um, civilizations. Right, and uh, Constantinople had become, thanks to the say broader Roman imperial system, of course, a massive center would throughout the Middle Ages basically um, uh, curb any other of, of the large Hellenistic cities that existed uh, in the East. Uh, but tr still true that sort of Adrian, um, in fact, coastal urban Hellenic dimension that was ethno-culturally different of course from even very Hellenistic which doesn't literally mean Hellenized in, in, a, in a fuller sense areas like Egypt, Syria and Palestine right that had always been essentially Semitic, Kemitic countries they had had a, a very different history from the one of the Greeks um, they had been conquered um, back in the day by first Alexander, then, then uh, Rome, and the, they had followed, given that from millennia they had been under pharaohs and kings of kings, etc., and the populations were normally, um, say, if not pacified completely, as the Romans about the Jews, or, but even the same Egypt, right, at the time, given this... Uh, human tide that it constituted w was a problem because these are the problems of a normal pre-industrial system that tries to have a, a stable political territorial control over immense areas um, we're more habituated however to this sort of uh, subjection in some ways um, and had um, in over time maintained what existed already before in fact Alexander and Rome, an oligarchic government, right? And this meant specific centers such as Alexandria for Egypt, um, etc., had always um, been, been maintained as the center of the broader province. They were quite critical uh, uh, strategic uh, centers provided with massive infrastructure, um, uh, particularly meaningful uh, 
international location, right? From Egypt, you could, of course, access the the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean. At the same time, you had, uh, of course, in Syria, the last branches of the of the major routes, at least, of the Silk Road. Um, the the Persians, the Iranians, whoever had been ruling from the Iranian plateau, so had always relentlessly tried to strip Rome of um, of the Levant, right? Uh, back in the day with the Parthians in a sort of ridiculous fashion, telling you the truth, um, and I really mean it, um, it, given what the historiography was writing at the time, much less ridiculously with the Sasanians that, as you know, had become a massive um, uh, power in the region, especially with the loss of the West as a whole. Constantinople was, say, Rome had always been the by far the greatest power, right, with Persia, but in Byzantine times now, it had been really a, a life struggle. In any case, Rome had proven, the new Rome, at least in Constantinople, to be superior, yet again, to the Sasanians had been crushed at battle. Neither the um, the, the likely Persia, and as it would happen, in fact, uh, under the Muslims, would have kept pouring out, let's say, civilization, and you can not fail to see that essentially the, the same Arabs were mostly uh, owing their Islamic golden age later on, on the basis uh, of Romano-Persian civilizations and culture, and um, essentially ruling from areas that were perhaps similar, especially Mesopotamia, the Basid Caliphate later on. Um, they were Semites, after all, just like the Arabs, and there had always been important contacts and intersections, right? And we've seen it from, from the, bon uh, the Bronze Age and um, beyond. Um, and uh, the, the sense of this, say, uh, massive chunks of provinces being lost to reputedly inferior enemies like the Muslims, uh, even due to a decision from these centers to, say, in part realizing that they had become too dependent, especially as far as the as the army was concerned in Constantinople, but also coming as an acceptation from the same provincials that, uh, at least on the longer run, they could hope that a power right, like the one that was forming there, and that would go more far, as you know, that, than expected, but would, in that sense, provide with a general stability at some point. Again, at this point, they couldn't really know it for sure. In fact, as we will see now, there was even an attempt uh, of the Byzantines were in, uh, uh, in agreement with, with the locals to retake Alexandria, right, and they even they, it even succeeded, but just not for long. Uh, and just to keep on, however, making things work right uh, on. And the following, for example, Arab siege of Constantinople, as you know, was carried out from the sea with which fleets, if not obviously the Christian ones of, uh, in fact, of, of Egypt, of Lebanon, uh, of Syria, because th those were, first of all, the only ones that the Arabs had but they could have never convinced them to do something like this if they had not seen in the opportunity, right, of opening like this new, uh, of taking actually the Mediterranean away from, from Constantinople further, especially in the east, a massive opportunity for the fortune, right, of their trade, of their expansion. And this largely, under the caliphate, would, would happen, not in the most uh, splendid of ways, telling you the truth, because, as you know, the caliphate fragmented itself as soon as it was established, right? But in inside, right, there, it was um, it was reputed by the local elites as a, as a more interesting horse to bet on, right? Than keeping to pay Constantinople for, uh, by the way, a, 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 a con an obviously, by the way, brutal behavior. Because what does a person from Constantinople have to do with one from uh, from Egypt? or Palestine, objectively, right? Especially when these lands were um, essentially fueling the contrast with, uh, with central government by um, by essentially pumping like this, these true heresies, right? That were being born out of the, not of particularly, you know, different uh, spiritual inclinations, 
it, this actually could be the case, like even of, of the population, but that obviously were in the hands of these powerful patriarchs that were factually the um, the only responsible truly for this uh, for these choices that were absolutely um, regardless towards the unity right of Catholicism, uh, and that for example, and that obliged, however, the emperors to to confront them and to, to appease them in some ways. Uh, something that, importantly enough, the allegedly barbarian um, West never did, right? The uh, During the early Middle Ages, the uh, Latin Germanic Church remained staunchly orthodox towards the, all these weird, um, say, decisions that more or less officialized by the empire that later have to do also with this um, attempt to suppress provincial autonomies further. Think about the iconoclasm. We made multiple videos about that. Um, the say a greater um, first of all. Okay, let's not digress on iconoclasm. That is an incredibly controversial thing because it turns out that uh, it's not quite right. We nobody knows exactly what happened at the time because when the uh, the so-called iconoclasts were put down, uh, everything was destroyed, and we think that most of the, the, the critique to iconoclasts later on theologically was actually based on same iconoclastic texts, but aside from that, and I explain in those videos why that is the case, um, in an apparently, only apparently weird way, uh, the point was that uh, after the first wave of Islamic invasions that really half, literally halfened the extension of the empire and the the same fragmentation of the caliphate the byzantines began to reaffirm a control from the center to the periphery by putting down all these various sort of um diversions from at least a unitary way of say uh, of, of christian life there were some places i don't know in in the in the Balkan hinterland, that had that were really massive monasteries that um, brought people to um, to really identify mostly with the, the, the cult of the local saint before every uh, imperial consideration. And, and it, it's difficult, in, in theory, not to be sympathetic to that if it wasn't for the fact that that the Byzantines actually couldn't care less about that either, right? Uh, and they very often compromise also with those heresies. Um, not these ones specifically, but the ones like monophysitism, as we'll see now, etc. Um, even, say, going against the most limpid orthodoxy of Rome, for example, and using this as an excuse just to sack the various provinces and so on. Because it was becoming really just a massive race for survival. Whoever got the most uh, with any mean, uh, the greater the chances were to, uh, to save oneself. Consider that notoriously for... From the loss of Egypt onwards, Constantinople had to literally uh, shift the supplies for uh, feeding the city mob of, in, in the capital. Um, uh, given that Egypt had mostly been that uh, that original source of, uh, and the connection with with the Black Sea, with the Ukrainian plains, right, um, and the grain. Uh, produced there would become uh, much more uh, would become first of all a necessity but also uh, literally shifting the a massive amount of political even before then trade or say communicational uh, directions right um, so again the notion that the Arabs would have been at the moment even more tolerant than the Byzantines it's um, it's not entirely correct Right, initially, like they didn't really want to give up so easily um, uh, to to these invaders. That at the moment, also because they were continuing their fight, they were actually requiring lots of resources. But it's not necessarily how much you pay, but rather the broader stability that derives from that at the moment. Which, when of course you don't have um, an imperial army defending you, uh, is maybe sadly the most obvious. Right, and generally speaking, the there would be an adaptation. We'll see it in in other in other videos dedicated specifically to these to these provinces. Um, 
But there was a, a true hatred from an ideological point of view on the base of religious divergences, and do not underestimate that either. Right? It's like saying you know, today's populism that is also very much against the, the very core of traditional religion, saying, I prefer, I don't know, to be taken over by uh, a less developed and less capable and uh, just worse uh, power than, uh, you know, seeing somebody else keeping on controlling us, even though it's been positive, actually, to have... Uh, received to, to have been say controlled even though control is a big word and still makes uh, the populist narrative I, that's the only reason why I use it because actually this was mostly a cooperation again the, it could have not been possible for anyone to rule uh, especially for the Arabs who were originally very few to rule on all these regions if, if de facto the local establishment had not been immediately you know brought to uh, to contribute to the system. Um, this is always the case, right? But it's really a self-sabotaging mentality that could easily spread among the, the sort of alienated masses of the great, um, say, it was in part uh, the choice of an establishment that, however, was the one understanding better the 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 magnitude of the loss, but, say, it was probably supported by the masses um, that thought that... Uh, this new change would have brought to uh, to the fall of the same of their own elites, even because that's what gets what it gets down to, and um, and this was done in a much messier way than it happened similarly, for example, in the in the West, uh, etc., and in different other circumstances, um, so that things wouldn't change much, nor they would change necessarily for the better, right? But this is the point. The entire country was conquered by the Arabs uh, without apparent difficulty, right? That is to say, almost without fighting. Um, and so one of the richest provinces of the empire was lost. The disaster was so big that the Byzantine government, profiting of the internal difficulties of the caliphate, attempted uh, an extreme counteroffensive when in 645, an imperial fleet, in fact, appeared in front of, of Alexandria, uh, reoccupying the city, even, right? But this was still an ephemeral success, and after a few months, the city was retaken by the Arabs, right? Um, the sense, strategically, is, is, is evident, because this is not very differently from what, I don't know, Louis IX would do in the 13th century, etc. If you take the, um, in this case, Alexandria, and from there, essentially, the, the Nile Delta, you can really, by controlling a very small portion of, of the entire historical territory, in fact, control the wall of it, because uh, the entire country develops uniquely in uh, following the course of the Nile. So every... A resource area. Of course, it, it's a very extended territory. You the, the, here, they were not planning to simply reconquer the entirety of Egypt, but the dependency, right, of uh, the country on these major centers in Alexandria, that, as you know, was one of the, the greatest um, cities out there, uh, historically, for many reasons, uh, would um, hopefully represent a thorn in the side, but not for, for the same Arabs that, however were at this point much more safely uh, in control of, of the Levant and that aside from their internal divisions they were severe and the uh, rapidity of the conquest could easily right, retake control of the situation. It was just a, disper a desperate attempt. You, you don't know exactly when you're carrying out these um, actions, what that can bring to, and if you have the uh, luxury of the initiative, as the Byzantines did in this case, you must always try uh, for this stuff, because it could evolve even in a positive way, but even if it didn't, and the system was really contracting brutally, like late antiquity here, I'm, I'm not going to digress on this either, but uh, is uh, thought at this point to have really um, uh, involved uh, 
right in these centers that would have been some of the last ones from which it would have been preserved uh, in, a, in a relatively unspoiled fashion, but that is also a bit of a myth, like the myth that, of course, there was no continuity with late antiquity later on. It's just something that we decided. But even if the Islamic conquest was for good, and the um, th this gr this enormous war, right, of uh, and also quite productive one, etc., would be lost um, for the empire uh, that had to really make up for it, reinventing a bit uh, itself during this moment of of dramatic crisis. Furthermore, after having subjugated Egypt, the Muslims continued to expand along the North African coast and conquering the African Pentapolis in 643. This would be Cyrenaica fundamentally. And from there, pushing further uh, in, the, um, in the hinterland of the country and beyond the Sirta Gulf, arriving to take control of Tripolis. Right? This was also uh, an area which historically had remained uh, quite tied to the Byzantine world, to uh, Hellenistic culture, but not all. Right? These um, coastlines had been intensely Romanized. They had also a romance actually coming from, because they had been settled by, by the, the Romano Italics uh, historically. And being of course Christian, Right, and these uh, it's interesting because uh, both the language and the religion was maintained uh, for a while. It would be interesting to look at this region a bit more in depth uh, in some other video, right? And in in this way, it came to threaten. You know that the Muslims would have arrived to to the Atlantic later on, right? But this was already um, uh, threatening essentially the northern shores of the. Western Mediterranean, uh, with raids mostly, right, but still meaningful ones, because especially the rich Byzantine Sicily, about which I made a video, by the way, um, specifically on, was already becoming the target of the pirates that were fueled also just by the uh, the Berber population of the interland that, aside in fact from the coasts, uh, the coastline historically, the, the the few fertile areas were. Uh, were just an enemy, right, of civilization there, and were, in fact, uh, just joining the piracy. That, let's stress it, was, yes, was Islamic, this was the, the, in a broader sense, we're given that the political direction was in days, those areas. But considering that the true naval forces in terms of ships and crews were provided by the coastline, were, was essentially Christian. Right. And in fact, later on, when you look at the Saracens, um, you shouldn't be surprised to find Christians among them, right? Uh, both in the Western and in the Eastern Mediterranean. And so what we were saying before about the self-sabotaging sort of, um, say, exploitation by the side of desperates sometimes, especially as the pirates normally are, of the instability in the, in the Mediterranean Sea, was the, the fruit of a general collapse, right, of what had been the ancient unity of the Ecumenic Empire, not much of a importantly pre-planned thing. Also because technically, aside from all the, um, let's say, problems that the Saracens caused um, to the northern shores of the Mediterranean, the latter were always richer and especially uh, much, but I mean much more populated, than um, the southern ones, and as a consequence, you know, the, the greatest influence was exerted by Europe on North Africa and hardly ever the other way around. And, and still, again, these um, pirates, etc., were essentially existing there because there was a system in the north that they could somehow exploit, they could even be called by as mercenaries. Into uh, I made multiple videos about the Saracens, and we will keep talking about this phenomenon. But in other words, we got too whiny about the um, era of the second invasions um, as Westerners without realizing that actually the greatest potential was in Europe, really not uh, from say, the, the countries of, of the invaders, 
uh, per se in this case. It's not to say about I'm not talking about the caliphate as a whole, but that's exactly the point, right? That even though, of course, this was the broadly speaking Islamic world, the especially the Western Mediterranean was really um, I'd say there was also eventually the the the, the Emirate and Caliphate of Cordoba, but those Muslim powers mostly t um, terrestrial ones. Right, so even when you look at piracy, especially from Tunisia, that that was the most active group, and of course um, other uh, war bands that came from all over uh, the uh, the southern shores of the Mediterranean. You're still looking at at a real frontier with the north, right? The broader Islamic civilization was not particularly interested in Europe per se, right? We get this very interesting picture of it, which, in my opinion, has a lot to do with. Uh, not just the fact that great part of the Islamic world in the eastern part was essentially a Middle Eastern Persian influence one, so one it was objectively distant from Europe, but that also was heavily Hellenistic and as such really uninterested in much of the external, right? Islam does expand in this time up to Southeast Asia. It, it really creates this massive, especially trade net, Right, that was kept functional uh, by the, the relative stability that the various uh, chunks of which the caliphate broke uh, down into, and that was were essentially based on prior bases of civilization. We were talking about Mesopotamia; it was a Sasanian legacy, at least where the, the Persians tried to centralize the state. The Levant, Egypt, were just again Hellenistic regions historically the same. Tunisia was Roman Africa, the, uh, I mean, Spain was just the, the rich Batica in the south, right? So, um, but the idea was, and, and immediately, in fact, they didn't, they wouldn't have this dramatic naval potential. We're talking about acts of piracy, not about major fleets that couldn't, you know, it, especially in the Western Mediterranean. In the East, it is true, yes, as we were saying before, the naval arsenals of Syria, Egypt, and Palestine were, were massive, because they were the Roman ones, though, right? And so um, the attempted um, uh, siege of Constantinople by sea was, in any case, thwarted, um, even when there were this actual Christian naval forces uh, in service of the Arabs. Um, and the point being is that the Hellenistic culture, anyhow, had always remained, as you know, pretty much... Um, and bubbled in itself, right? The, the Greeks were that people that, when conquered by the Romans, they literally thought that nothing had happened, basically, that they were still the Greeks, they were living in their own perfect world. Uh, it was essentially crystallized since, you know, a, a very long time before, uh, and that their culture, their belief, in part it is true when you consider what nature of empires really was, right? It was just, you know, an overlord while you essentially maintain most of your identity locally. But, um, and over, even over this, this great amount of time. Uh, but, as you know, the Hellenics uh, had been historically xenophobic. They didn't consider anything outside of the Hellenic world essentially worth of praise, if not just the sense looking at the new masters and saying, well, you got it. Uh, uh, over us, right, and um, but overall not really caring so much as our culture. Maybe distinct impression is that uh, the Arabs, not as it were, essentially Arabicized elites, mostly of these other countries, remain very much within that sense of Hellenistic mentality, about which we know, by the way, they knew a lot, right? We know in Arab times that a lot of stuff circulated uh, from, in fact, sources that unfortunately went lost. Um, over time, uh, because of various wars and destructions and so on, but that that literally knew about I don't know travels to 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 Iceland, to literal um, you know knowledge about the ends of of the world that had surely been gathered in much previous times, and only God knows how much unfortunately we lost right in over the centuries especially after, I don't know, the, the Mongol invasions, various other um, political upheavals that the Islamic world was much more, let's say, destabilized by at the end of the day, when also this initial sort of bureaucratic state of 
in fact, Romano-Persian origin uh, began to decline, like in the later, let's say, in the 10th, 11th century, uh, but already with important signals uh, before. So it's extremely complicated to talk about this, in, in, especially in a video that is technically dedicated to Constance the Second. But it's also important to stress because, after all, the Byzantines had been the guardians of that uh, knowledge of those worlds, and that's how far they were lost. All right. At the same time, this would change the face again of the empire. That would become much more insular. Uh, would withdraw within itself. The seventh century is quite obscure regarding also about uh, Byzantine literature as a whole. I always remember one, one of my Byzantine history professors at university was, was a guy who he was actually just a philologist, but he had, a Greek philologist, but he had ended up teaching Byzantine history at our university. And, you know, he, he just had a thing uh, by himself uh, for seventh century Greek literature. And he was, he told us, he was mocked continuously because, you know, in philology, everything is very classicistic, as you can imagine. So in, in, in Hellenic literature, like the, the, the war, the most, after, you know, the peaks of the classical age, like what do you study? The 7th century, just like saying the darkest um, era of all. And, but the guy liked this history and so wanted to, to know more of it. And um, this, this time is, is really, really um, much more dramatic. Than, than we think, uh, which is mirrored also by this uh, issue um, of, in fact, uh, say the, the scarcity of documentation. And consider, again, that we, we mostly picture, okay, the Arabs arrived from Arabia and they conquered these places. It's, it's not about that. It's about other regions, right, of, um, on the frontiers of the empire, uh, its outskirts, that were turning, keeping to turn against Constantinople, right? And very different ones. Uh, for example, you know, well, there is a wide difference between Armenia and Egypt. Even. But in the former country, there were other, uh, there were Arab incursions. You know, as you know, um, this was essentially a feudal world. The Caucasus had always had that sort of, you know, encastellated profile that um, you know was rendered ever more complicated by the the, oro the, the quite um, complex orography uh, of the country the Arabs began also here to um, to subsume the various uh, noblemen there were there was resistance were fierce struggles but this was also an excuse like for when looking at the troubles of, of Constantinople from these Arab Armenian forces to raid into Asia Minor that would be gradually lost over time, it would become a frontier, right, before the expansion up to the 11th century that consolidated further also in, into Armenia, etc. Uh, and that at this point, however, brought to the Arab capture of Caesarea, Kaiseri, in Cappadocia, right, and some forces, some Islamic forces arrived to sack the same Byzantine province of Phrygia, which was a uh, quite big deal because it was far west and in one of some of the most strategic areas of the empire in as much as it controlled the, the, the western uh, entrance to the Anatolian plateau. And so it meant that basically just uh, this, this is a pattern would be followed also later. There is a very different environmental division, as you know, between the coast, that is the Greek one, and the internal... The, the Anatolian interland is another thing, really. It's much more continental, but it was dangerously close as the crowd flies to the same Bosphorus. Um, and again, remember this. A few decades before the Persian army had crossed all this territory uh, and managed to lay siege to Constantinople, uh, in, endangering the, the, the empire, right, to the point of annihilation right so um, when th this is fascinating to think because uh, when you blockade Constantinople literally the empire doesn't have much of another subsistence by itself right if at that point the city had fallen the Theodosian walls making always their uh, job until 1453 almost eliminate Fort Crusade but that's another story um, the um, that um, 
the entire system would have collapsed. This is literally also what says what Machiavelli says, you know, about the Ottoman Empire, the bit the successor of this centralized system. At that point, there is not much. Yes, there are provinces that can hold out things on their own, but the same fall of Constantinople equated to the disappearance of the the entire empire. Very differently from say the existence of different peoples, of layers of peoples, like the Arabs met in the West, right, and keeping to existing indeterminate areas. Um, so there is no doubt that this Arab attack came from the same basis that had been used by the Sasanians, right, uh, two decades before. And as such, right, it was being supported de facto by the same people. And don't underestimate this, because while, for example, Sasanian Persia had been disintegrated and it would have re recomposed, it was exactly because of this an enormous hatred towards the Romans. And so at this point, well, the Arabs arrive, they're powerful, let's not mess with them, but and so let's exploit this to um, to hammer down uh, Rome and uh, getting some revenge uh, in the process, right? So it's this moral history rather than we should look at, not just at mere, I don't know, pawns on, on a map. Starting from the 60s of the 7th century, by the way, uh, the Islamic incursions in Anatolia would have repeated uh, regularly, constituting for Constantinople this uh, forever incumbent threat, right? So the Arabs would gradually consolidate their presence, at least as Islamic forces, uh, in on this frontier that actually would become very fringe um, for the for the caliphate, even though it was close to in fact. Uh, to, to Syria, to, to civilized places. Uh, but it would be exactly for this, like it had always been a, an era of mountaineers, of castles, of fortresses, of, say, warlike fanatics that were replenished uh, uh, during the various exiles, right, that occurred after the, the bloody struggles uh, between the same Muslims in the areas so the most fringe uh, sort of rebellious sects of Islam would take refuge in that, uh, I don't know, on the towers, on some other areas, in the, even on the Anatolian plateau. Um, and this would contribute to keep on the pressure to Constantinople, especially at the beginning when uh, with the Umayyads, etc., like the, the caliphate was still, in that case, was centered in Syria, but also later on, um, for a while, could put up... Um, more unitary pressure on on the Byzantine Eastern frontier. That helped, anyway, in spite of all the trouble that we will see also in other videos. Um, and that is yet a thing that should be appreciated, because this interland could uh, was poor, was less developed, so it was much easier to float right uh, between uh, the, the two contendants, whereas that hard stock of the coastal Hellenic urbanized area w was a very different thing. Right, and the Arabs at that point would have been fighting very far from their powers, uh, say, bases of power, uh, and um, stretching their their action again. They they could they had the capacity of besieging the same Constantinople, which was a massive deal, but that was also a massive gamble at the same time. So if you failed that, you, know, you couldn't quite simply replicate that infinitely. Right, it was just either we get it now or we're gonna have a problem on the on the longer run because otherwise you cannot really dislodge the Byzantines from their power bases. And this makes you see in perspective also how um limited the same Islamic conquests were. We are impressed by the massive legitimately by the massive extent of, you know, uh an em an empire stretching from the Atlantic to the Indus. But in that regard it was also something that never was kept together, even when it was established, because it was so huge that it was always uh, initially ruled in a decentralized way and eventually f fragmenting just after the conquest. Um, so during the Caliphate of Uthman that began in 644, we are in, in the Rashidun period, right? So the, the rightly um, guided 
rulers before the the first fitna uh there was the major in fact um the, the first major clash and fragmentation between um not just say different uh, warlords um muslim warlords but also the different views of power that were critically uh, appearing right regarding the, the same theology the same um, the same religious outlook and how and how to, to practically hold this empire institutionally, which was a massive deal. But in any case, at this point, we are in 644, the beginning of Ottoman's Caliphate. The Arabs, as we observed, became a naval power. And this was manifested by the Islamic capture of Cyprus, Rhodes, and Kos, so quite strategic islands that were exactly um, seized in order to serve as bridges, as point de uh, point de pu for um, the naval operation capable of supporting an army besieging Constantinople uh, across the Bosphorus, right? So in 655, Constance II decided to try a naval action right to crush the islamic fleet however it was him to be ruinously crushed together with the imperial fleet um, commanded by himself off of um, Phoenicia, of lycia in the essentially in the south of uh, anatolia it was quite like basically the um the the the, the choke point Right, with with roads uh, between Rhodes and Cyprus uh, for further progression along the Anatolian coast towards Constantinople, and this was also another. This was the battle of the so-called battle of the mast, right? Um, that we will see. I made a video about Byzantine naval tactics, by the way, but this, um, you know, uh, defeat is of great significance because the Byzantine telesocracy that had been built from the 5th to 6th century that had allowed uh, the Justinian and reconquest of the West and the fact of the reconnection uh, like a, of the entire Mediterranean uh, and uh, up to this point thanks to the, uh, the, the, the deterrence of the Imperial, uh, the Imperial Navy was over right uh, this was a a big turning point because the muslims would never had the um say the complete upper hand on the mediterranean as a matter of fact the byzantines always remained uh operative uh the eastern mediterranean was thus uh, more dangerous water for the muslims um but as we've seen in the west uh there was a greater impact Right. But even there, mostly by some smaller uh, naval forces, mostly designed to carry out raids rather than threatening navally, right, any significant basis, right. The Islamic conquest of Spain, also the wanting to go, was not um, really taking into account uh, a major, say, naval expedition, I don't know, in uh, mostly, say, the, the Muslims would do that with Sicily, but also that was a gradual penetration and conquest, as a matter of fact, was never a massive statile capacity to field a, a naval force uh, capable of crashing, like supporting a major um, army to, I don't know, rising through southern Italy. No, right, there were important forces here and there, but uh, in the early Middle Ages, in the high Middle Ages, this... Um, uh, would never lead to a sort of major naval invasion or conquest, right? That would immediately seize what, as it, it risked to happen instead of Constantinople in the east, as uh, she was besieged. And again, the Battle of the Mass is what brings here Constantinople under threat, right? Up to this point, uh, the Byzantine fleet hadn't uh, had rivals because, again, no other power. Uh, also in continental Europe could simply field, uh, could put at sea, let's say better, this, uh, such such large uh, 
navy, and uh, that's the reason why the same Byzantines had been relatively conservative about that, but, but navies cost, right, and they're technically not even what carry out conquests, they're mostly um, a, a tool to support uh, terrestrial operations, that's why perspective this is also important, it's not much to control the sea, um, but that, that realistically also in an operational point of view it would never happen until the Victorian era, right, if you look at naval technology, but still the capacity to advance with land armies uh, being uh, really like being supplied from the sea it was easier but not in this sense not having the, the, the ships carrying the service out being threatened by enemy now forces um, uh, even though again in 655 the Byzantines suffered this great defeat uh, at sea the Islamic pressure met with a setback exactly in, in the year afterwards when Ottoman was assassinated, right? And this brought to the first fifth man, that is to say the civil war between Ali and his rival Muawiyah, right? And I, I talked about this first phase in some video, but we'll come back um, on it in some other Islamic history one. Um, this in practice brought to the Byzantine Empire five years of relative tranquility given that the two sides had also concluded a peace treaty right? um, more fortunate were uh, also thanks to this temporary relief Constance II's wars in the Balkans um, this uh, theater uh, I discussed a lot in many videos. We looked at the Slavs from the, uh, the strategic on the cell to Maurice. We have started analyzing a bit more in depth also other stories from the, uh, the Bulgarian to the Serbian ones, etc. And we have observed the particularly difficult nature of this frontier. Uh, the fact that from the other side you had the Avars uh, essentially mobilizing the Slavs also against uh, the Empire, right? But uh, for a reason or another, uh, Constance managed to exploit a temp this, this favorable situation to offend uh, the, uh, the Balkan region, leading to the reacquisition of some imperial territory. We don't know even precisely which one this was, we just know that this attack took place in 658 in the part of the Balkans occupied by the Slavs, obliging some of these that, well, they, they control basically the entire interland as individual clans, though, so not really in a statal sense, um, and probably in, in Macedonia, to recognize the Byzantine suzerainty, while others were deported, perhaps in Asia Minor, there are the, the Slavs of, of Anatolia actually that were uh, located um, mostly in the West as um, manpower, right, they were used for the army, especially given that the Islamic frontier now was uh, essentially there, uh, and it was a way to repopulate, to just also separate these uh, rebels from the um, Yes, they were deported. Some would re relocate there also because there were better lands in some way. Uh, but they would remain severed, of course, from their, uh, from the lands they had occupied before. These were, uh, in part, literally, um, say, a prey of war as um, deported prisoners. Um, and this will mark a bit of a further, you know... Uh, uh, multi-ethnicity of, of the, the Anatolian peninsula that, as you know, is quite stratified uh, in that sense, right? There, there is seemingly toponomastic trace of this settlement too, right? And we will talk about them. I think I discussed this um, in some video, I think about once the origins of the Serbs or, or something. Uh, the, the Balkan scenario was, was important because, you know, through this success, uh, Constance could uh, relieve uh, the valleys, right, uh, leading to the Aegean Sea from some pressure from these um, clans, right, this tribal 
associations were quite loose, but they were scattered pretty much everywhere, and so they could um, they could mobilize uh, with a certain degree of you know, aptness to raiding, to significant damage to uh, to the especially to agriculture that supplied the army, uh, etc. Uh, also, Constance the second as his grandfather Heraclius before him found himself to cope with this quite um, thorny issue of religious controversies that we hinted at before. These kept uh, opposing the orthodox and the monophysites with the habitually devastating influences on the internal cohesion. Right? And in fact, the orthodox discontent towards this continuous policy of appeasement with heterodoxy when not open heresy was causing a great resistance to Constantinople in the West. Right. Uh, the reason, again, why Constantinople was doing this is that it was trying to reach an agreement with the monophysites which had been um, critically uh, leading to the loss, let's say, of uh, the Levant, right? And that uh, at this point, Constantinople was negotiating to sort of getting back, because again, this is the point, they, these regions had fallen into the hands of the Arabs, but the local communities, the local churches were saying, well, look, you know, if you are more um, reconciling on the grounds of our monophysite belief, we may actually pave the way for, in fact, an imperial invasion to retake these places from the Arabs. We will essentially rise against them. Uh, this was still the picture, because again, we know eventually how things went, right, ex post, but at the time these Arabs could essentially uh, disappear as the hand come, right? And so what was established later. Um, it was also the consequence of the incoherence of this, again, appeasement policy towards heresies in the first place, right? Uh, as this was creating problems to Constantinople uh, in the Latin world that was still quite important for the, um, for the general, especially now that the Levant had been lost, right? So, you know, um, for the, the general compaction of the empire. In 647, Pope Theodore I had excommunicated, uh, due to these issues, the Patriarch of Constantinople, Paul, that was actually a defender of monothelitism. Um, the, the idea, again, is that uh, monophysitism is the heresy uh, pretending... Uh, Jesus to have actually only one nature, right, uh, in one person. So, uh, going against the, the dogma of, of course, both the, na na uh, the, the divine and, and the human nature uh, of Christ. While monothelitism was, um, uh, also with a spin-off of monoenergism, was essentially this, this idea that Christ had a single... Um, purpose a single energy stemming from these uh, two natures, uh, which I think is a pretty idiotic uh, way of overly complicating uh, pretty plain situations. Like, you know, was Christ schizophrenic? But what the hell do you need to, to even invent this kind of current? And the answer is that, of course, um, the the discord reigning in the uh, in the in the eastern part of the empire had brought to the various communities just to sign these various um, excuses of terrible ideologies, just like today, right? You know, there are actual Westerners with actual uh, wealth, etc. That you know believe that Marxism is a real thing, right? You would think that's an autoimmune mental disease. But, uh, of course, it's a thing that has some political pool of some sort. At least it's weaponized, instrumentalized in a way that, of course, lesser people can think to have any relevance uh, in the world. But this is not uh, helpful for uh, our policies, for our power uh, in general. So imagine this, again, in, in a time in which 
the coercive deterrent capacity necessary to maintain a stable territorial uh, dominion is ridiculous compared to our own, right? Um, in Imperial Africa, there had already been a violent um, movement uh, caused by the theologian Maximus the Confessor that had legitimately rose against uh, monotheism. This was one, Africa had always been a problematic province. Many people say, ah, oh, you know, the Byzantines should have not reconquered Vandal Africa, they should have used it like a buffer state. That, that's actually not a thing politically and strategically. That was the best thing the Byzantines could do. But of course, there was a cost to the maintenance of this area, right? It, as we've seen, was tormented mostly by the, uh, the attacks of the Berbers from the interland, and especially since it was a fairly distant uh, province from. From Constantinople, it was complicated to defend, and the locals were essentially developing a sense of their own, uh, their own. Thing. Also, Heraclius had actually stamped from there back in the day uh, before his coup, etc. So, it was again a different world. This had belonged to the West historically, and legitimately, this this lands did not understand why would Constantinople side with uh, with such heresies. So, given that this was the consolidated praxis, the religious controversies would end up to be exploited just on the political level, aside from whatever the masses thought about complex theological problems that they debated, like people debate the highest systems of the world without understanding anything of that. But at least in this specific cases, the Exarch of Carthage, Gregory, with the support of the local clergy that of course took these as, as an elite right and as actually one of the most powerful elites existing um, in the in, in the world at that point would rebel to central government in the name of orthodoxy again you want to appreciate this you want to appreciate that the west was always uh, in a sense they could have done they could have found their own heresy Right, just like the, uh, the 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 Levantines would, they wouldn't. And you want to appreciate this, especially considering that in the West, say, of course, these were lands of ancient Christianization, as a matter of fact. But also in the Romano-Germanic kingdoms, it wasn't actually. It was initially Arianism, but it was never like a big deal. Like it was never a theological crisis about this with Constantinople. And on the contrary. Whenever these compromising policies of of uh, Constantinople would present themselves um, uh, towards the, the 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 Eastern heresies, even the Arians, even those who were, however, gradually normalizing to Orthodox Catholicism, were um, defending the Pope, right in in Orthodoxy, and so this this is particularly relevant. Uh, because the West was pretty compact in saying, what the hell are you even doing there? Uh, in any case, the Exarch of Carthage died in 647, uh, importantly enough, fighting against the Arabs that had attacked the African Exarchate. Um, and the province uh, would uh, actually, in the process with the death of Gregory, come back to to obedience, right? So, the um, this was not the time the exarchate fell to the Arabs, but uh, even though the emergency and the death of the uh, the exarch were uh, essentially um, putting an end to this uh, temporary rebellion or essentially um, separation from Constantinople, uh, the threat, uh, the signal right, of the fact that the Westerners weren't liking really what was happening in Constantinople was not um, was not really, uh, was felt at least right deeply. But the Byzantines wouldn't actually uh, back down. They would, on the contrary, insist on the at least on the sense of unity that was required so not say that the message was this do not watch what we are doing now with heresies because the most important thing now is to stop uh, 
these new invaders as it seems that the empire is falling apart. In fact, in 648, Constance tried to put an end to these internal religious issues through a new edict known as the Tupas, which uh, abolished the ecthesis of Heraclius, which had been, uh, let's say, supporting monothelitism. So, in this uh, effort, also ideologically, um, to stress um, a theology regarding the unity of, of intent, right, that had to mirror the ones of the empire. But at the same time, uh, Constance essentially prohibiting for reasons of public order any other discussion in matter of faith. So from this was the usual level, you know, strange Byzantine take on this thing. Like from one side they would say, okay, well, now I abolish uh, what my, that hell of, of a ruler of Heraclius, uh, his grandfather was saying like, okay, we fully bind to monothelitism as an extra, you know, um, dogma. Right, so we cancel that, but it's so to 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 appease those who would be uh, in fact bothered by this uh, heterodox, uh, to say the least, innovation. But at the same time, any other issue uh, regarding monophysitism, monoenergism, etc., or even the same monothelitism at the end of the day, would have to be quelled. Right, in other words, shut the hell up. Nobody can say something against us because we are the true uh, rulers of the universe and we rule the same church. And you know that this was also the, a big the, the deal because just like the Senate we're referring to before, the same church of Constantinople had been built, like subjected to the emperor, right? At some point it would gain some autonomy, even going against the same rulers. We've seen it many times, but not say more, more as an internal... Uh, let's say uh, dynamic than one that would try to go against like I don't know in, in the West eventually with investitors struggle the literal wars and so on uh, there was a, a substantial overlapping right um, except this was in fact not the case in the West that would in spite of this um, let's say distance between uh, that there's just you know a in that sense, a political and even a geographical one between the papacy and the emperors would actually uh, catalyze a dramatic civilizational spin-off and sense of control. Um, given the, the current situation of, of the world between these this two universal authorities, and of course, was not to buy into this. Byzantine version of what the church had to behave like so it's some sort of just appendix of um, uh, secular power like just commanded by that of course um, in the Byzantine world the emperor was to was the vicar of Christ on earth right this is something that instead the papacy would have never accepted because the church doesn't belong to this world and the matter is much more nuanced. Um, Rome had an enormous, and this was true for basically all the West, like the papacy already at this point had been acquiring um, uh, a radically magnitudinal uh, impact uh, on on Western spirituality. Uh, the West was with the, with the papacy, right? And the differences between this Latin Germanic world and the and the Greek Byzantine one were being already at this point evidence because they followed more or less the same cultural divides that had always been existing between uh, the two eras, even during the uh, the Roman Empire, right? And this um, uh, was uh, was worsened by the sort of volatile and authoritarian character of Constance. There was apparently a sort of very uh, a rancorous, shady, uh, sensitive man in some way. He was not, let's say, a, um, say a weak ruler, right? But he had some sort of disdain for uh, 
um, for all these uh, issues that he was contributing himself to to create. In fact, he demonstrated himself scarcely interested in the same theological disputes, and he brought to this um, order of silence without basically any compromise with with the other side. Right? Why should that have been the case? Why should especially the church be silent about you know some transgressive behavior of of the emperor? Uh, that's what the church is there to to check in a Christian empire. Um, plus, Constance issued very severe penalties for the uh, for those who would infringe his new laws that went from the deposition for the disobedient bishop to the actual corporal punishment or exile for the private citizen, which was, uh, you know, quite a, an impositive measure, which in fact ended up to reveal itself ineffective to, in fact, the Church of Rome specifically uh, opposed such, um, such silence, such uh, repression, and in 649, Pope Martin I summoned uh, in St. John Lateran a synod that concluded itself with the condemnation of monotelitism and uh, of the two following imperial edicts, right? So both the uh, Ectesis and the Tupas, uh, even going against properly the imperial house, both uh, Constance and his grandfather's legacy, right? So bear in mind, at this point, we will see it better in, in a while. Rome was, uh, in theory, part of, of the Byzantine Empire, but had dramatically autonomized, made lots of videos about Rome and Ravenna. At this point in history, also looking at who really controlled the cities, um, etc., while essentially the Byzantines had exhausted themselves um, against the, trying to reconquer the peninsula from the Longobards that instead had gone in the upper hand and had had even their boundaries recognized by the Byzantines, right? And actually the two sides were quite homogeneous in, in an Italian way rather than, um, say, at this point being there a strong Byzantine presence. But the capacity of the of Constantinople to interfere still with the Italian affairs was quite strong, especially in this case, because the papacy was still recognized not just by the West but by the entire Byzantine Empire as de facto the, the most authoritative, um, of course, voice in, within Christendom. So aside from the fact that still. The idea was the council was superior to the bishops, where before the Gregorian reforms, etc. Um, the uh, Roman spiritual power was greater than any other, and uh, especially in the West, this could, this, uh, the opposition of the same against um, Constantinople could bring to great issues for, of, uh, say, of control of, of these very areas that were surrounded, as we've seen, by, by enemies. Um, shortly before. Uh, the Council of uh, Central Lateran, Constance II had sent to Italy the exarch Olympius uh, with the task of essentially crushing the opposition to the Tupas, the edict that, as we've seen, Constance had issued, and, if possible, to arrest the Pope as well, right? Uh, now, this is interesting because the, the Byzantines had this sense that if they wanted, they could take bishops and putting them down, including the papacy, right? And this tells you the scale of brutality that, you know, Byzantine political culture really, really had. But of course, uh, as, an auto as a truly ecumenic autocrat, the Byzantine emperor thought he could command, in fact, uh, anyone, including the church. Now, the Exarch Olympius um, found himself um, in, uh, in Ravenna to operate in a, for which, as you know, the, the, essentially the entire Byzantine uh, peninsular government depended. Uh, 
so including the one in Rome as well, in a situation of great instability. Because, of course, uh, the Italians here didn't really like this thing, uh, nor the, the Byzantine areas, nor the Longburn ones. And so, becoming aware of these difficulties, um, and especially with having the task of uh, unlikely at that point uh, deporting the, the Pope, he actually sided with Rome, rebelling to Constantinople. This is one of the most beautiful things. Like made lots of videos uh, in different um, contexts, right? Of, again, the Byzantine attempt to control Rome, the Italian Peninsula, and we have seen how much of a actual divide. Doesn't matter how you know this sort of weird culture that has to tell you that every second that the Byzantines were Romans existed as far as the sort of Latin Germanic opposition to the Byzantine Greeks, right, as literal foreigners in a foreign land from the one of Rome, right. Um, and Olympus, by the way, because uh, the, the Ravenate exarchate was very powerful, right, so managed to, to rule in Italy in spite of all for a couple of years. However, he died in Sicily in 652, where he had gone to fight the Arabs that for the first time had landed on the island, right? Uh, this was a, a big deal for many reasons, because Sicily was also pretty functional for the same Rome, for the same Ravenna to maintain as a granary, right? Some further resources for the imperial administration. Um, in the peninsula. And generally speaking, it was just an interesting land from which you could at some point even raid into Africa, as it did happen at some point. Uh, the same Islamic invasion of Sicily, uh, Sicily having to do with um, a essentially a, a promiscuity existing already, like the, the local Byzantine rulers um, fighting the Arabs in Africa and or for them as allies at some point, right? So, it, again, in that video about Byzantine Sicily, I, I explained this uh, to a decent extent. We'll come back on it at some point. Um, given that Olympus had providentially died, the Constantinopolitan emperor sent to Ravenna a new exarch, right? Theodorus Calliopas, that had already been in office in Italy in the same vest of Exarch some year before, right? And as a first move, Theodorus Calliopas uh, managed to reduce the Ravenate militias to obedience, right? These were quite active, right? Um, let's remember that Ravenna, just like Rome, uh, was one of the largest cities in, in the empire at the time. So you have actually this important concentration of urban centers in, in the western part, as opposed to the eastern one, that in spite of having historically been, say, more historically or urbanized at least, um, was um, witnessing a greater decline of cities, and, and had already, um, and or at least had, because um, considered the western part was also Mediterranean, late antique one, so not just what could happen in, in the north, um, after the end of the Western Roman Empire, but generally speaking, swallowed by Constantinople as the bigger system, quite a unique one. Constantinople was, by uh, a few actors, larger than Rome, right? Um, in any case, um, with these Ravenate forces in 653, Theodorus Calliopas marched on Rome, occupying the orbs without, uh, essentially without a fight, right, because the process had been smooth, considered that there was always a Roman uh, nobility there, controlling the militia, controlling the papacy, there were different factions. Makes the long story short, the Pope was arrested and deported to Constantinople, where he arrived in September 1653, after three months of um, navigation, which is interesting considering that it would take much less, but this was not a pleasure, uh, say, travel. And in fact, 
in Constantinople, the Pope was kept in prison for uh, 93 days, being finally sentenced in front of the Byzantine Senate, which moved against him only the accusation of high treason, essentially for having backed the um, rebel exarch Olympius, and on purpose they didn't want they didn't let the pope uh, speak right uh, especially so in, in matters of faith that would have represented also in constantinople and this tells you how big the papal spiritual authority was um, uh, a great effect politically and might have actually been a um, let's say even a the basis for some further in fact religious uh, change um, in there. Pope Martin I was sentenced to death, even, after the double humiliation of having been stripped of the ensigns and having been brought um, across the streets in this um, infamous uh, defile, uh, in fact, in, in Constantinople. Uh, this was pretty cruel as you understand at the last moment however the life sentence was suspended and roughly three months later Constance the second sent the Pope in perpetual exile in uh, the Kersenesus Tauricus that is to say the Kherson of Crimea where he died in 655 um, this naturally was a great affront to the entire Western institution it was an important show of, of force and of power um, but this wouldn't bring Constance to particular fortune especially now that he had uh, decided to intervene personally in the same Italy for a bit the same reasons we have seen before um, essentially coping with the Longbirds and the Arabs, especially the latter, right? The Longbirds were aggressive, but they also had spent much of their resources. They were just gradually expanding at, at the detriment of the Byzantine territory, but more or less uh, amidst long truces were not pieces. Um, while the Arabs were more unpredictable, uh, they were, as we've seen, settled now just uh, in this. In, the North African coastline facing Sicily, and so a pretty short um, uh, stretch of sea that could bring to an invasion. And the Emperor thought, uh, there is some historiographical debate, it's interesting to look at these times because we don't know too much of the role, of likely shifting his entire court uh, permanently to Syracuse, at least not of course, Constantinople would have remained the capital of the empire, etc. But seemingly, Constance was really interested in what, um, say, the strategic situation was there to handle, especially the, the maritime threat of the Muslims. And uh, he, uh, this could be uh, also a proof to the Italians that uh, the imperial efforts were. Uh, substantial and, and effective in a way, but there were also more practical stringent, uh, dangerous reasons. So Constance in 663 landed in Taranto uh, with an army, right, and as his first objective he headed towards the Longobard Benevent, capital of the homonymous duchy in the southern Italian Apennine, that he besieged now, the Duchy of Benevent, uh, I made a video about the so-called Langobardia Maior, and we're talking about the Longobards, they're really an important chapter uh, in European history. Um, the Duchy of Benevent was the most important polity in, uh, in southern uh, Italy, in the southern Italian mainland, as far as this continental um, power uh, of uh, threatening, essentially, the, the Byzantine coastland was concerned would expand dramatically and knocking it out from the same capital would have been uh, say uh, a good idea however 
at the news that the troops of the Longbird King Grimoald were converging on the besieged city to break off the, 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 blo the Byzantine blockade, Constance withdrew to Byzantine Naples, to the coast, just to the west. Um, and this shows, like, first of all, there are interesting passages from Paul the Deacon telling us about the siege of Benevent, the resistance of the Longbird um, garrison, the fact that the Byzantines beheaded the Longbird, um, uh, the Longbird uh, ambassador and catapulted uh, their head, if I'm not wrong, or sent it back um, to the city. Right, so uh, really not uh, easy, you know, times, especially. The, 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 the theater and the, the military cultures involved are quite fascinating. Um, in any case, here the Grimoald was king of the Longbirds, but he was formerly the Duke of Benevent. And we are informed on demonstrating also that it's BS that the idea that the Longbird duchies were cro chronically divided, uh, you know, fighting against one another. This is actually debunked by uh, a good 70 years of historiography now telling the exact opposite. But aside from that, um, the the picture is interesting because Paul de Diocan was paradoxically, even though he was a northeastern Longbird, writing the following century, much more informed about the Duchy of Benevent because there had been um, uh, deep connections between it and his native Friuli, about which I also made a video for the Historical Region series. And Grimoald, of course, came back from the north with this army and to essentially save his own native uh, native duchy, right? So this is a bit the problem that everybody would have also later on, that the, the mountainous interland on southern Italy is very difficult to control. And so while the Byzantines controls the coast, the continental part is always in the hands of the Longobards, so you can't quite easily dislodge them from their terrible terrain, as basically anybody camping there found out the hard way at some point. Um, uh, so a part of the Byzantine forces uh, even actually faced the Longobards in open field in a locality known as Forino between Salerno and Avellino and it came out defeated by the Longobards. This is also uh, interesting. made lots of videos about Longobard warfare, we'll keep talking about these episodes at some point as well. From Naples, Constance II reached Rome, um, entering uh, the what was technically actually the the, the 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 capital still of the Roman Empire. Right, uh, he entered there on July the fifth, six hundred sixty-three, from the Appian Road, of course, from the south, and he was. Um, greeted solemnly by the Pope Vitalian and by the Romans. Uh, he stopped there for 12 days. Of course, there was not much that the Romans could do at that point, with the Imperial Army and, and all, but that was the point. Um, he didn't leave much of a good memory, though, because he seemingly uh, expoliated part of the, of the precious metal of the Pantheon roof, right uh he needed to cash like and that's how in the 7th century is the moment of greatest material poverty in this in the middle ages you operate you you loot everything you find um in rome the emperor participated mostly to religious ceremonies uh to appear perhaps a bit more uh, acceptable in, in the eyes of the romans eventually he went back to naples and eventually to Syracuse in Sicily to establish there, as we've seen, his own residence. So the campaign against the Longbirds failed. Um, it did continue, like as there was intermittent warfare in the pr first place um, from both sides in, in the region on a regular basis, but it wouldn't, in fact, lead anywhere, like the, the major campaign led... Uh, against um, Benevent by by the, the Saint Constance at the head of an imperial army was a big deal, right? Uh, for just the same Italian theater, and again, it 
basically stalled in front of Benevent, right in the f in the face of Longbird power. So basically, they wouldn't uh, reach the objectives for which the campaign had began. Without considering that later there wasn't much that was done, also to 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 stamp the Longbird counteroffensive. All right, they, the Longbirds were limited themselves in attacking the more fortified centers of the coast that could be resupplied by the Byzantine fleet that still existed, um, and that the Longbirds instead uh, didn't have means to cover because they were not essentially a, a seaborne power. Um, uh, this uh, was not necessary, however, if you consider the um, the discontent that all these operations led by Constant were bringing to, right? Because, first of all, the military fort had um, increased uh, taxes, and especially in Italy, this was done at the expenses of, of the local population with brutal methods that was resented uh, also in, in Sicily that, at that point, was... Yes, again, it was a land, one of those lands we hoped, like uh, each one in, in autonomy, but had been fairly, uh, fairly, say, aligned with broader Byzantine interests, right? Aside from, again, this exarchs trying to usurp, etc. Um, so there was a great um, arrest against Constance, so much so that in 668 in Syracuse, um, apparently, when he was bathing, uh, the same emperor was assassinated, famously enough. And this is how, basically, the project to bring back the West at the center of, of imperial policy was uh, was terminated. Um, this is an interesting perspective, because um, this Italian expedition represents an episode of remarkable importance. It's really the last... A Byzantine attempt to recover the dominion of the peninsula, at least um, concretely, right? There would be um, later on, of course, um, the attempt to reconquer Sicily. There were moments of, say, even in the 12th century, as you know, there was the effort to crush the Sicilo Norman kingdom and to share the, the region with the papacy. But at this point, let's say, um, you still have one empire, essentially, other. Romano-Germanic kingdoms that, in a way or another, still recognize some sort of, um, say, Roman influence right in the area, and so um, also this thing of shifting the 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 court to Sicily is fascinating, um, with even the the entire uh, imperial government in that sense. So, uh, aside from the fact, of course. Constantinople would have likely remained the center of the empire anyway, and of course we, we don't know more than much why uh, uh, Constance uh, really chose to do so. There has been some speculation regarding his intention, as for example the same Byzantine court was strongly opposing his measure. Perhaps the emperor thought that having lost the... Um, the east, uh, he could uh, reinforce his position in the west, reconnecting these lands that were, say, uh, quite still quite rich after all. Looking at the the average of of the Mediterranean, so uh, it, it's difficult really to think what was going on. Considered that the same Arabs that would invade Spain a half a century later still had a relatively loose sense of the geographical dimension. Of Europe and um, thought, ideally at least, that they could reach Constantinople from the west had they, you know, uh, kept penetrating in Europe from um, and pushing east right towards uh, the Balkans. Um, so uh, it's really difficult to understand here what was going on. We'll see something more in depth to focus on it better, right? But it's worth remembering that it was the first time after the fall of the western uh, half of the Roman Empire that a uh, sovereign of Constantinople would visit Rome, right? Even if his permanence in the city was 
um, surely rather heavy for the inhabitants that, as we've seen, were systematically exfoliated of, of the bronze of the antique monuments, including the Pantheon, uh, that already uh, at the time had been transformed, by the way, in a Christian church. So again, the idea that you know the most Catholic Orthodox emperor arrives and the thing he does is starts exfoliating Roman churches, right? As a Roman emperor is not really uh, this great policy. So you can appreciate the scale of some sort of weird disaster that probably Constance II uh, widened um, in the, say, a front, right? In the in this sense, you, that you must understand also as a Byzantine autocratic ruler, like the idea that he was the emperor, had a, a conception of power that was really uh, very different from the one that the West had been witnessing historically, also because of that Hellenistic sort of more Eastern mentality, the hybrid with even Persian tradition, um, and the ways it had fundamentally uh, habituated to wield power um, in Constantinople in a much more, in fact, uh, authoritarian way. Um, but this is something perhaps we will see better in another video because it's often like thrown there like now but not quite analyzed in depth. Instead, it's very fascinating and worth um, of attention. Right. For today, however, I stop it here. Hopefully we will keep talking about Byzantine history soon. This history of emperors that we go by mostly when not only, but you know, for also completing the list right over time. For today, however, I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.